Good evening, welcome. I'm Hobson Wildenthal, and as provost, it's my privilege to welcome all of you here tonight to the University of Texas at Dallas uh, to another in our distinguished and now historical series of lectures on the Holocaust. This is a extra special year in the history of the Holocaust lectures. Uh, not merely that we have yet another distinguished guest to tell us about his research and thought, but also because after years of planning and dreaming, I'm able to proudly and happily announce that the advisory board of the Holocaust Studies Program under the leadership of Dr. Burton, Dr. Burton Einspruch has created an endowment fund that will enable the lecture series to continue in perpetuity as the Einspruch lecture series on the Holocaust. And I want to thank the board and particularly Burton What the board and, and Burton and Zhuzhi have accomplished is a testimony to what happens when you have a profoundly important idea, which is the Holocaust Studies Program, when you have an inspirational leader, which is Dr. Zuzana Oshva, and when you have energy and persistence, uh, which Burton and his colleagues on the board have shown. And we now have the library materials uh, endowed with the Jaffe Collection. We now have the lecture series endowed. Those endowments can always grow and enhance still further those two programs. But Burden and the board will continue to work on the rest of the agenda, which is to endow a professorship in Holocaust studies and to endow scholarships for students pursuing Holocaust studies. But we have made great progress over the last three years, and this therefore is a signal year in the history of the lectures. So without further ado now, I would like to introduce my colleague and friend, Professor Jana Oshvoff, who will in turn introduce our speaker of the evening. Good evening. I am enormously happy tonight because on the one hand we have here Dr. Cranwell, on the other hand because this is a special day um, in which we were told that there is enough endowment that we can go on and that this program will go on um, for a very long time. So um, I would like to to say thank you to everyone who has helped us to get so far. And I would like to thank in the first place, of course, Dr. Einspruch, who has indefatigably worked on this uh, very hard and difficult task. And I would like to thank for all the board members. I would like to thank the Simpsons. I would like to thank everybody who was instrumental in bringing about this incredibly grandiose and wonderful start. And I also, on another note, I would like to thank many people who were instrumental in bringing about tonight that there are so many people, that it was so well advertised, that the food was so excellent, and so on. And I would like to thank also specifically Mr. and Mrs. Nussbaum who gave their beautiful house to us last night for a wonderful party um, celebrating the coming of Dr. Conwell. I also would like to thank Stan Levinson and his staff for helping to advertise this. Catherine Evans and the workers of the visual arts I would especially like to thank Catherine has done incredible work throughout all the year, and in a way, we have to be enormously grateful to her. I would like to thank 
a number of other people, um, among them Michelle Long, Paul Bre Paula Brett, Christy Baxter, Gary Haas, and the print shop for the gorgeous invitation and print material. Would like to thank for people who have given a wine for tonight, the Glazer Distributing, and Rat Coleman, and we would like to thank the Culinary Art Catering for this wonderful reception. Um, I also would like to thank my Holocaust Studies class, who has helped in incredible ways, and countless other people whose name I couldn't list now because it would last for too long. But I thank everyone and each person for his or her help. And at this point, I would like to introduce our guest speaker. It is my honor and privilege to do so. And it is uh, Dr. John Conwell, a senior research fellow uh, at Jesus College, Cambridge University, England. He's a man of many, many books. He's an author of many, many books. And he is um, regarded as one of the most uh, major people in Catholic studies and the studies of the Pope and the Vatican. But his activities are wide ranging and if you had the opportunity to speak with him, you probably know about his many, many interests and many, many other books. And the importance of Hitler's Pope, the secret history of uh, Pius XII, is uh, one of the major books written on the topic. Uh, it also is a major book for the Vatican itself, he will probably speak about this, to examine itself and to perhaps stop the canonization attempts um, uh, of um, the present Pope, John Paul II. Uh, the book has been celebrated everywhere by the greatest scholars of, um, of this field. Without further ado, and ask for your um, forgiveness for occupying this place so long, I would like to ask John Quanvel to come. Well, I want to say how grateful I am to uh, the provost of this fine university, Professor, and to Professor Osworth, and all of those who, who have um, been so generously involved in um, uh, the scheme that brings me here today to talk to you. I'd like to begin by giving you a brief signpost as to the direction in which I'm hoping um, to take you this evening. Uh, I want to draw a parallel uh, between church-state relations from 1933 in Nazi Germany and the world of uh, academia, the university world, and science uh, in Germany during the same period in order to show that, <clears throat> as in any other period, there is no such thing as a um, neutral disciplinary haven from social, moral, and political responsibility. And by spending a little time on this issue uh, this evening, uh, I hope to show that all of us, old and young, faculty and students, people of all generations and faiths and those of none, can continue to learn from the Holocaust and um, reflections upon it um, 60 years on. And in this way, I trust that my talk to you this evening will fulfill a crucial criterion in the mission statement of your Holocaust Studies program. And uh, I will quote specifically what I'm thinking of, if I may. The Holocaust Studies program 
at uh, the University of Texas, Dallas, enables us to question our fundamental assumptions of the nature of humanity and culture and help us examine not only our basic beliefs in progress and enlightenment, but also the wide-ranging potentials of the modern state. In this way, Holocaust studies sheds light on the power of Nazi ideology and on the bureaucratic and military apparatus that was enlisted to implement the murder of millions of people in an orderly and routine process. In addition, these studies help us experience the triumph of memory over amnesia, explore the relationship between prejudice and atrocity, and teach us responsibility uh, for one another. An interesting play has been pulling in <coughs> large audiences in London and New York these last couple of years. It's called Copenhagen, and it's by the British playwright Michael Frame. It depicts an episode in the life of Werner Heisenberg, the German scientist, who was in charge of the Nazi atom bomb project. In 1942, Heisenberg went to Copenhagen to visit Niels Bohr, one of the great fathers of quantum physics, whose sympathies were entirely with the Allies and who secretly was in support of the Manhattan Project to develop the atom bomb. Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg had a conversation which historians of science have been arguing about ever since. Was Heisenberg attempting to discover how far the West had got with its bomb? Or was he, as he told people after the war, attempting to persuade Bohr to discourage the Allied scientists from going ahead with their project? Or, again, was he missing a key equation in the development of the Nazi bomb and was therefore attempting to elicit some crucial information from Niels Bohr? Well, there are many versions of this fascinating episode in the Second World War. Michael the, uh, Frame, the playwright, uses the story to draw a parallel between a simplistic version of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in quantum physics, which uh, I'm sure you'll be pleased I'm not going to elaborate on this evening, <clears throat> but a popularized notion of the principle is that light behaves either as a wave or as a particle, depending on how the researcher makes the observation. Michael Frame's play and the issue of how he sees Heisenberg um, as hero or neutral or a villain and the atom bomb finds parallels in the life and times of Pius XII, especially his negotiation with the Nazis in 1933 and current attempts on the part of the Vatican to canonize him as a saint. At the process of canonization, the sainting of Pius XII occurred a couple of decades ago, there would have been two judges involved, two ways of looking at his life. One would be looking at the events of his life in order to demonstrate that he is a saint, and the second judge, a figure once popularly known as devil's advocate, would have been trying his damnedest to prove that Pius XII was a sinner. So, particle saint, wave, sinner, or perhaps it's the other way around. The nub of the Copenhagen plot is the uncertainty of biography and history. One version of the story, and it's his own version, that is Heisenberg's version, is that he knew how to make the bomb, but frustrated all the attempts to succeed because he did not want Hitler to possess such a devastating weapon. This makes him look a pretty decent fellow. And by implication, it damns all those other scientists, many of them Jews, who left Germany from 1933 onwards, some of whom helped to make the American bomb, which blew up Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and killed hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. Another way of telling the story is this, that Heisenberg was not such a good physicist after all that he got his sums wrong, and hence fumbled the bomb project. He would have been capable <coughs> um, 
uh, of making an atom bomb, had eluded um, the um, theoretical and practical problems. As it was, he kidded people after the war that he was only pretending not to know the principles so as not to help Hitler. As a result of these two versions, we find that Heisenberg and his colleagues were either demonized or canonized by post-war biographers and historians. Um, Thomas Powers and Paul Rose's books are examples of these two extremes. Um, <clears throat> so it depends on how they tell their story, even though they're telling um, the same uh, they're dealing with the same core of evidence. Uh, and that core of evidence includes the famous farm hall tapes. After the war, Heisenberg and his colleagues were under arrest in a house outside Cambridge, and their conversations were taped and transcribed after the Hiroshima bomb was exploded. Those tapes can be interpreted in two ways. But there's a parallel um, and um, uh, there is a parallel. Uh, um, sorry, I can't read my own writing here. I'm so sorry. But anyway, um, what, what this is leading up to, ladies and gentlemen, is um, to introduce to you um, a notion which is neither um, the demon, uh, the sinner on the one hand, or the hero and the saint on the other, um, namely the fellow traveler. Fellow traveler in the context of the Nazi regime is one who took benefits, received goods, concessions, protection of various kinds from Hitler, from the regime, and yet remained sufficiently aloof politically, morally, as to claim immunity from the actions of the regime. Historians of the period have been scrutinizing the phenomenon of fellow traveling, investigating the behavior of various professional elites, including academics, scientists, engineers, doctors, economists, lawyers, and churchmen during the period of the Third Reich. What certain historians of science are suggesting, and I would mention in particular Mark Walker and his book, Nazi Science, is that fellow travelers did far more damage, were more culpable. The effects of their actions were far more incendiary, far more dangerous even, than the actions of those physicists like Start, Leonard, Pasquale Jordan, who became enthusiastic members of the National Socialist Party. Walker claims that in the post-war era, individuals and groups of individuals were depicted either as villains or saints, depending on whether they sided publicly with Hitler, joining the party, the SS, or whatever, or whether they resisted Hitler, working <coughs> actively against the regime, or leaving the country, or being passive in the sense of refusing to do anything that would aid the oppression or the war efforts of the regime. The one great taboo subject in the historiography um, of science during the Third Reich, according to these historians, um, has been the situation of the fellow traveler. It is within this context that I made so bold in my book as to suggest that the future Pius XII, Eugenio Pacelli, despite the fact that he appeared to stand morally aloof from the Nazis, and detested Hitler, and did much to help Jews during the war, was nevertheless Hitler's pope in that his dealings, concessions, accommodations with Hitler were far more damaging <coughs> than, he had, than had he been a card-carrying Nazi bishop. It's taken many years to break the historiographical taboo that surrounded fellow traveling. And when it happened, there was a concomitant effect, which was to expose in a new way the hypocrisy of those individuals who argued that they were not merely neutral, apolitical, defending Germany, but that they were in fact courageous resistors or dissidents and thus deserving of praise. 
Heisenberg is an outstanding example of this. Heisenberg, in much that he wrote and much that he said in the post-war era, supported the myth that he had participated in a conspiracy to prevent Hitler from having the bomb. On the basis of all that is known, this was not true. And it is in this light that his true position as fellow traveler becomes, in my view, apparent. And so to Pius XII, Eugenio Pacelli. Allow me to start by making a brief character sketch of the man who was Pius XII. If you had met Pacelli when he was Pope at the height of his career in 1950, you might well have been immensely impressed. Certainly, most people who encountered him became immediately infatuated. He had charisma. More than six feet tall, he weighed only 125 pounds. Light on his feet, regular in his habits, he looked extraordinarily young for his age, even <coughs> when he was in his 70s. People were always struck by how extremely pale he was. One observer wrote that the skin, tightly drawn over the strong features, almost ash gray, unearthly, looked like old parchment, but at the same time, it had a surprisingly transparent effect, as if reflecting from inside a cold white flame. Another observer wrote, and I quote, his presence radiated a benignity, calm and sanctity that I have certainly never sensed before in any human being. All the while he smiled in the sweetest, kindliest way so that I fell immediately head over heels in love with him. I was so affected that I could scarcely speak without tears and was conscious that my legs were trembling. Born in 1876 in Rome, 15 minutes walk from St. Peter's Square in a modest apartment, his family were not aristocrats and they were not rich. They were lawyers of a rather unusual kind. His grandfather and his father and his older brother were lawyers in the service of the popes and the Vatican. They are what is described as canon lawyers or church lawyers. Apart from his older brother, there were two sisters. The Pacellis were extremely respectable and pious people. Their lives were soaked in Catholic piety. Daily prayers together, private prayers before the statues of the Virgin Mary. Eventually he entered the seminary, a college where priests are trained in Rome. But his health was delicate and the food did not agree with him. So his father and grandfather used their influence with the Vatican and he was allowed to study at home, which is most unusual. Uh, most candidates for the priesthood uh, who have failed to stay the course in the seminary are dismissed. He wore the priestly robe in the apartment and would bring a book to the table. After seeking permission from parents and siblings, he would spend mealtimes buried in his reading. He was a mother's boy. He had one notable friendship, which was with a priest. He loved music and could play the violin. His reading was the classics. He was clever and had a photographic memory. He had a great love of a little book entitled The Imitation of Christ, which he learned by heart. This book was in fact designed not for priests, but for monks, religious men who spent their lives hidden from the world. This book encouraged meditation, rejection of social relationships. It encouraged self-denial and above all, silence. And I quote from the book, as long as I have been out and about mixing with men in the world, I have returned lesser man. That was the kind of thing he was brought up on. When he was 23, he was ordained priest and immediately entered the Vatican as a bureaucrat. 
He was an outstanding favorite from the beginning and was chosen in his first year to accompany a cardinal to London to represent the Pope at the funeral of Queen Victoria. His work in the Vatican focused on international relations and naturally, like his father and grandfather, church law. Pacelli became the world's leading expert on international treaties between nation states and the Vatican. These treaties are known as concordats, and you're going to hear something more of concordats this evening as my talk unfolds. His doctoral thesis was on the relationship between these concordats and church law. What should be done, for example, if reforms or changes in church law affect the validity of international agreements made between the Holy See and foreign governments. Let me give you an example of the sort of problem in which he became a world expert. What if the law of the church should be changed, and in fact this did happen uh, after 1870, so that the Pope, and only the Pope, has the right to nominate new bishops everywhere in the world. And what if there is a concordat, a legally binding international agreement in existence, and there was in fact in Germany, whereby the local priests and the government were legally entitled by church and state law to choose their own bishops? What should be done? And how should it be <coughs> resolved? What had primacy, the international agreement, the concordat, or church law? It was precisely this problem that was to shape Pacelli's career for nearly a quarter of a century before he became Pope. The legal studies that preoccupied Pacelli as a young priest and canon lawyer were of crucial importance in regard to the relationship between the papacy and the rest of the church and the world through the 19th century and the first decade of the 20th century. The 19th century had seen the rapid growth of nation states, the separation of church from state, the secularization of societies, and, as the Pope saw it, the oppression of the Catholic Church. Most serious for the Popes, was the loss of their temporal power, the great papal states that described the midriff of Italy. To maintain the unity and <clears throat> ensure the survival of the Catholic Church, something had to be done to compensate for the decline of the Pope's temporal power. This was particularly urgent since, as it seemed likely, the Pope would become a virtual prisoner within the secular foreign power of the new Italy he could lose all credibility as a sovereign, independent authority. So it was that in 1870, at a special gathering of the bishops of the world, the Pope promulgated the great dogmas of papal infallibility and papal primacy. This meant that when the Pope made a pronouncement on faith and morals for and with the entire church, that state would be irreformable or inerrant. At the same time, he made it clear for all time that he, the Pope, at the pinnacle of the church structure, was ultimately in charge. This settled once and for all an argument that had been mooted down the centuries between those who believed that authority should be shared among the bishops of the world and those who believed that the authority should be enshrined in the Pope alone. At first, the great dogmas did not make a huge amount of difference, and the reasons were not far to seek. The application of the dogmas required a corresponding legal instrument, a new book of church law to give force to the vastly unequal power relationship that had arisen within the church. Up to this point in history, church law, canon law, had existed in a vast jungle of decrees and special local discretions. The plan now was brought forward 
to encapsulate the new dogmas of papal infallibility and primacy into a new formulation of law with no exceptions. All, the laity, bishops, clergy, would now be equal in the eyes of the law with no special cases <coughs> and uh, no precedents um, in culture or history. Uh, all would be equal in the eyes of the law and such a formulation and the model on which it was uh, <coughs> on which it was based derived from the modernizing spirit of Napoleon rather than the casuistic um, pluralisms of the past church law. In 1917, Eugenio Pacelli was involved as a principal in the writing and publication of this entirely new book of laws for the Catholic Church. It was known as the Code of Canon Law, and some historians have described it as the most important event in the history of the Catholic Church in the 20th century. That book, that Code of Canon Law, described for subsequent generations of Catholics all the lines of authority which flowed from the Pope at the pinnacle of the Church with penalties for disobedience and the refined definitions of responsibility. Unfortunately for the Vatican, however, the laws in this book contradicted a number of concordats that had been made between the Pope and Germany going back hundreds of years. So it was that on May the 13th, 1917, in the depths of the First World War, Eugenio Pacelli was made a bishop and sent to Germany with a view to renegotiating these agreements and concordats in order to bring them in line with the new book of church law. He had been appointed papal nuncio, in other words, a church ambassador, and he would remain <coughs> in Germany for the next 13 years, shuttling between Berlin and Munich and Rome. In this sense, May the 13th, 1917, should be regarded, in my view, as one of the most important dates in the history of the Catholic Church in Germany. Uh, first, he was in Munich, and it was here in 1919 that he witnessed at first hand the Bolshevik uprising that threatened to draw, draw Germany into revolution. And it was here that we get a rare personal insight into Pacelli's attitude towards Jews. Here is his account of the Bolsheviks provisional HQ in Munich in 1919. This is quoted directly from a letter which I found in the Vatican archives from Pacelli to the Pope in Rome. At that time uh, was Benedict XV. The scene that presented itself, he writes, at the palace was indescribable. The confusion totally chaotic, the filth completely nauseating. Soldiers and armed workers coming and going. The building once the home of a king, resounding with screams, vile language, profanities, absolute hell. An army of employees were dashing to and fro, giving orders, waving bits of paper, and in the midst of all this, a gang of young women of dubious appearance, Jews like all the rest of them, hanging around in all the offices with lecherous demeanor and suggestive smiles. The boss of this female rabble was Levine's mistress, a young Russian woman, a Jew, a divorcee, who was in charge. And it was to her that the nunciature was obliged to pay homage in order to proceed. This Levine is a young man of about 30 or 35, also Russian, and a Jew, pale, dirty, with drugged eyes, hoarse voice, vulgar, repulsive, with a face that is both intelligent and sly. Um, <clears throat> well, Pacelli's constant harp harping on the Jewishness of this party of power usurpers is consistent with the growing and widespread belief among Germans that Jews were the instigators of the Bolshevik revolution, and that their principal aim was the destruction 
of Christian civilization. But there's something else about the passage. Uh, he wrote this when he was about uh, 42 years of age. Um, there's something else about the passage that is repugnant and ominous. The repeated references to their Jewishness amid the catalogue of epithets describing their physical and moral repulsiveness gives an impression of stereotypical anti-Semitic contempt. Next he was transferred to Berlin where be he became the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps. It was from this point onwards that his character begins to speak to us and he begins to come across as a distinctive personality. Self-controlled, very urbane, the master of languages, immensely charming, and yet imbued with a sense of simplicity and innocence like a monastic novice. At the same time, he was a workaholic, totally and fiercely loyal to the interests of the Pope. He was not a man of great friendships, he wasn't interested in drinking or companionship, and he ate frugally. For exercise, he rode the horses of wealthy friends outside Berlin. His domestic needs by this time were served by a nun called Sister Pasqualina, who was to stay with him for 40 years. She was a bully, and there is evidence that he tried to get rid of her, but in the end, he resigned himself to her bossy ministrations. He wore her like a hair shirt. There were two German priests who served as special assistants in his dealings with Germany. One was Father Robert Leiber, a Jesuit, and the other was Monsignor Kass, who was head of the great Catholic German Center Party, which held the balance of power throughout the Weimar period. We have it from Sister Pascalina that the relationship between the three, that's uh, Monsignor Kass, Father Leiber, and uh, Eugenio Pacelli, was fraught with petty jealousies during the time he spent in Germany and even afterwards when he returned to Rome. In Germany at this time, there were 23 million Catholics, about 34% of the population. I think it's important to remember that uh, by the time you get to the Anschluss and the um, Sudeten uh, Germans joining the um, Greater Reich, that the number of Catholics in Germany uh, rose to 50%. The Catholic Church in 1933 was powerful, resourceful, complex, and it had grown in strength ever since the era of the Kulterkampf, Bismarck's persecution of Germany in the 1870s. It had built up a host of Catholic associations. Its democratic uh, center party, the Zentrumspartei, uh, was a focus for um, all social and political action among Catholics in Germany. There were 400 Catholic newspapers, scores of Catholic universities, and special arrangements underpinned by church and state agreements, as we have seen, going back generations. What was Hitler's attitude towards the Catholic Church? Um, well, if one looks back um, to the period of his virtual obscurity, um, it's quite clear when reminiscing in um, his book Mein Kampf, he wrote that a confrontation with the Catholic Church in Germany would prove disastrous. During his vagabond years in Vienna, uh, he recalled, he had pondered the futile consequences of the Kulterkampf and had seen the importance of drawing a strict distinction between political Catholicism and religious Catholicism. Hitler loathed the Catholic Center Party, and it's clear that he plotted to drive a wedge between this political focus of the country's uh, Catholics and the devotional exercise of prayer, ritual, and education. So why should he loathe and fear the Catholic Center Party so much? The situation was somewhat similar to the operation, say, of Solidarity in Poland, which was so effective in bringing down the Polish Communist Party. The danger for Hitler was that a democratic grassroots resistance could be formed um, to threaten and undermine his efforts. 
just as political Catholicism had defied and frustrated Bismarck. The fact was, however, that the Pope of the day, that's Bismarck's time, Pius the, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not saying this correctly. The fact was, however, that the Pope of the day, that is of the 1930s, Pius XI, and his favorite nuncio or ambassador, Pacelli, saw things in exactly the same light as Hitler. Throughout the century, the popes had frowned on Catholic party politics and the forming of political parties. In fact, in Italy, uh, in the 1920s, Pius XI had presided over the dismantling of the Catholic party in Italy, the Partito Popolare, and had expelled from the country its leader, Luigi Sturzo. Nobody today, of course, would advocate the return or the rebirth of a Catholic um, political party. Um, during the interwar period, however, the Catholic parties were a democratic bulwark against Italy's fascism and the extremes of right and left in Germany. They were a genuinely center party appealing to aristocracy, middle class, industrialists, workers alike. But the reason that the Vatican did not like democratic Catholic politics, I'm afraid to say, is that it could not control them. The Vatican's dislike of democratic politics, in consequence, became a weakness that Hitler could exploit to grant privileges to religious Catholicism while destroying political Catholicism. And this was the basis of the negotiations between Hitler and Pacelli that would occur in the spring of 1933. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Remember that Pacelli's principal task in Germany was to resolve contradictions between the new code of canon law and existing concordats. His principal aim, therefore, was to increase the centralized power of the Catholic Church, not as an exercise in naked power, but in his view, to ensure the unity and survival of the Church in a hostile modern world. And not the least of his con concerns, as we have said, was to advocate the acknowledgement of the German government of the Holy See's right to impose canon law on its Catholic population. Pacelli had two principal tactics in his task. Germany was divided into lender or provinces, all of which were semi-autonomous with their own laws and different relationships with the principal Christian denominations. Whereas the overall government of the Reich, situated in Berlin, governed on a federal basis. Pacelli's first tactic was to negotiate concordats with the most important provincial states, or the lender, starting with Bavaria, which was most friendly to Catholicism. But secondly and simultaneously, he started negotiations to achieve, to achieve a Reich's concordat with the national government in Berlin. Any agreements he had achieved in the provinces would then be subsumed in this overarching concordat. Pacelli had uh, a modest success over a period of 16 years in negotiating local uh, concordats, but despite more than a half a dozen approaches between 1919 and 1932, he failed to draw the government into a Reich's concordat, even though five of the chancellors of Germany during this period were Catholics. So why was this so? The simple answer is that he did not take into account uh, the post-Great War pluralist realities of German society. His aims were too authoritarian, too focused on obtaining advantages for Catholicism over the interests of other Christian denominations. An interesting and illustrative clash occurred in August of 1931 when Pacelli had returned to the Vatican as Secretary of State, and he was paid a visit by the Catholic Chancellor of the day called Heinrich Brüning. On this occasion, Pacelli lectured Brüning on his obligation as a Catholic to form a right-wing administration in order to push through a Reichskonkordat, and that it should be a condition that that treaty be concluded at once. If the price of a Reichskonkordat was to draw the Nazis and Hitler into Brüning's minority cabinet, he said he should seek an agreement with him without delay. The Chancellor, 
Bruning told Pacelli brusquely that he completely misunderstood the political situation in Germany and the real character of the Nazis and the dangers of doing concordats with totalitarians who were likely to infringe the articles of any treaty while keeping the church to its own side of the bargain. Brunning was pointing to, abject, to the abject failure of the concordat signed between Pius XI and Mussolini in Italy in 1929. That was known as the Lateran Treatise, and that had put the church at immense disadvantage within a very short period. Despite this setback, even in November 1932, after Brunning fell and only a few weeks before Hitler seized power, Pacelli again made a start on a Reich's Concordat negotiation during the brief chancellorship of Franz von Papen. So I want to be absolutely clear on this, that by the time Hitler came to power in January 1933, and Pacelli was back in Rome as Secretary of State. There had been at least 16 years in which Pacelli had failed to pull off a Reichskonkordat with Germany. But at no time had he conceded defeat or relaxed his efforts or reneged on his ultimate goal. It's not surprising, therefore, that Pacelli responded with alacrity when Hitler invited the Holy See to in initiate negotiations negotiations for a Reichskonkordat in the April of 1933. Now I labor this point, ladies and gentlemen, because the official Vatican version of the history of the negotiation of this crucial international treaty, this Reichskonkordat between Hitler and the Vatican, is that Hitler had forced the church into the agreement by holding a gun to Pacelli's head. Well, it is certainly true that by April 1933, Catholics, or at least political Catholics, were being persecuted along with communists, socialists, and Jews. But it's important to grasp that the church had been seeking an agreement with the German state all along, and that in the course of the negotiations, Pacelli accepted a number of remarkable conditions on behalf of the Vatican, and supposedly on behalf of the Catholics in Germany. In the case of the 1933 Reichskonkordat, the central points, the negotiations, involve, the central points of the negotiations involve the protection of Catholic schools and the insistence, according to the Code of Canon Law, that bishops should be able to control the hiring and firing of teachers, along with other points mainly connected with the right of the Holy See to impose canon law on German Catholics. Hitler granted all these points, agreeing moreover to expanded budgets and places for Catholics in schools, more teachers, and even new Catholic buildings. But the conditions imposed on the German church involved the withdrawal of Catholics as Catholics from social and political action. So in a neat dovetailing of interests, Pacelli would encourage the center party to vote for Hitler's enabling act, which made him a dictator, and at the same time acknowledging in the Concordat itself that the center party must di disband itself voluntarily. Um, and that's a very important point because there's a world of difference between a political party that goes under through oppression and is forced under, and a party that goes under by agreement, which is what happened but it was led by Pacelli. <clears throat> there was a major difference, it needs to be said too, between this concordat and other church-state agreements conducted in Germany, or indeed most of the other countries in Europe with the exception of Italy. The ground condition of the negotiation was not that of dialogue between the Holy See and a parliamentary democracy, but the Holy See and a dictator. A point that's often overlooked by those who claim that this sort of concordat was all too common. Whereas parliamentary democracy had deprived Pacelli of his Reich's concordat ever since 1919, dictatorship granted him all that he desired in a matter of weeks. The previous German concordats in the Länder had been negotiated with parliaments. The Reich's concordat of 1933 between Pacelli and Hitler was an authoritarian charter 
negotiated in secrecy over the head of Hitler's ministers on the one hand and over the heads of the Catholic bishops and lay Catholic leadership on the other. It followed the authorit authoritarian model of the Lateran treaties, which Hitler had greeted with great enthusiasm in 1929 as a sign he claimed that the Catholic Church favors a fascist political model over a democratic one. I maintain in my book <coughs> that the concordat with Hitler was the beginning of Catholic acquiescence to the Nazi regime, not only in terms of failure to speak and act for offenses against human rights in general, but for attacks on the church itself. And it's important to start at this point in 1933 when the bishops were on the whole reluctant to grant Hitler such an endorsement rather than later when by 1937 to 38 the Nazi police state was in full operation and resistance would have been perilous. I maintain moreover that this stood in stark contrast to the conditions that led to the grassroots resistance to Bismarck's Kulterkamp 60 years earlier. So if my book is about anything, it is about the concomitant weakness of centralization, however laudable its appeals to unity. The story of the 1933 Reichsconcordat, as we know, can be told nevertheless in several different ways. One version has it that a gun was held to Pacelli's head and he signed it to protect the church in Germany from vicious Nazi attacks that had already begun. The documents, I believe, and I hope that I have conveyed some of this to you this evening, tell a different tale. Certainly, Hitler's perception of the Concordat was different from Pacelli's. The day after the treaty was signed, Hitler published a note to the world stating its significance in his view. He was, it was, he declared, and I quote, a historical triumph for, the, for National Socialism. The conclusion of the Concordat he wrote, seems to me to give sufficient guarantee that the Reich members of the Roman Catholic Confession will from now on put themselves without reservation at the service of the National Socialist State." End quote. Pacelli, on the other hand, writing in the official Vatican newspaper, Osservatore Romano, on July the 26th and the 27th, saw matters differently. And I quote, it is to be stressed he wrote that the Code of Canon Law is the foundation and the essential legal presupposition of the Concordat. This involved not only official recognition by the Reich of the legislation of the Church, but also the adoption of many provisions of this legislation and the protection of all Church legislation. Here is the true purpose of the Cura's Concordat policy, the single aim that ran through Pacelli's diplomatic policy from 1919 to the conclusion of the Reich Concordat. Later, Pacelli would alter his version of why he signed the treaty, claiming that he was obliged to sign for fear of the destruction of the church in Germany. Elsewhere, Hitler again expressed his own view of the matter. Writing to the Nazi party on July the 22nd, he declared, and I quote, the fact that the Vatican is concluding a treaty with the new Germany means the acknowledgement of the National Socialist State by the Catholic Church." End quote. Meanwhile, on the 14th of July, Hitler had declared in a remarkable cabinet, cabinet meeting uh, this statement, and I quote, "'It is an opportunity that has been given to Germany and a sphere of confidence created that will be especially significant in the urgent struggle against international jury. End quote. And that is specifically in reference to the signing of the Concordat. Hitler's statement can be understood readily from two points of view. First, the very fact that the Vatican had signed such a treaty indicated both at home and abroad, despite Pacelli's disclaimers in the Vatican newspaper, Catholic moral approval of Hitler's policies. Second, the treaty constrained the Holy See the German hierarchy, the clergy and the faithful, to silence on any issue the Nazi regime deemed to be political. And to be specific, since the persecution of Jews in Germany was by now a stated policy, the treaty had legally bound the Catholic Church in Germany 
to silence on outrages against Jews, an obligation Pacelli personally filled to the letter right through until the de deportation of the Jews from Rome. One might well see in this the beginnings of a pattern of complicity, albeit reluctant complicity, in Hitler's program, which Hitler could exploit for his own aims. Nevertheless, it might also be argued that Pacelli, the Curia, Pius XI, were acting well within Christian principles. Given the perils of the time, surely it was defensible that notwithstanding the long-term aims of the Concordat policy and the tragedy involved in plotting in secret the demise of political Catholicism in Germany, that with di diplomatic wisdom, Pacelli and the Curia were right to pin down these gangsters with a legal document protecting the institutional church and particularly the schools the hope of their future. But my quarrel with Pacelli, my critique of his initiatives, and indeed the institution of the Curia and the papacy of the time, and its relevance to us today lies elsewhere. And it is based on my belief that Hitler's fellow travelers, those who received benefits from the regime at the expense of others, while appearing to remain morally untainted, justified and aloof, were more dangerous, could cause more damage than Hitler's true believers, and there were Catholic bishops among them, the Grobers and the Initzers. Since its Janus-like contradictions, a hybrid of Dostoevsky's saintly Father Zosima and the Grand Inquisitor, what a challenge for the biographer, served to lull the consciences of 23 million Catholic Germans and arguably serves to lull the consciences of Catholics to this very day. On March the 31st, 1933, Hitler convened a working committee on church-state relations and education, which was attended by Pacelli's representative in the negotiations, Ludwig Kass. He traveled directly from Pacelli's office to the meeting in Berlin. The timing of the committee was significant, for on April the 1st, the very next day, the Nazis began their boycott of the Jewish businesses across the country. And there was more, as you know, to come in that April. <coughs> During that month, while Pacelli in secret was negotiating a remarkable package of special benefits for Catholic education, more money, more places, more buildings, more teachers, more schools, Hitler passed on the 25th of April with much publicity, his law against overcrowding of German schools and universities aimed at reducing the number of Jewish pupils allowed in these institutions. The act laid down a strict quota of school and college enrollments deemed appropriate for the size of the Jewish population. Hence, the self-same government with which Pacelli was secret negotiating favorable educational rights for Catholics was simultaneously trampling on the education rights of the Jewish minority. It is, it is at this point, I argue, that the Holy See's Christian principles did not form a seamless whole with its authority to speak and act on behalf of the church. That Christian love came adrift, dislocated from ecclesiastical authority. Inescapably, the papacy, the Holy See, and German Catholics were being drawn into complicity with a racist and anti-Semite government. And this was only the beginning. Also on April the 25th, in support of the business boycott against the Jews, the purging of the civil service and the professions of Jews, and the education quota system, thousands of priests were required and the Concordat would impose upon them an obligation accepted by the Vatican on their behalf in law to become part of the anti-Semitic attestation bureaucracy supplying details of blood purity through marriage and baptism registries. These attestations, moreover, would the following year implement the Nuremberg Laws, the Nazi regime system for distinguishing Jews from non-Jews. Catholic clerical compliance in the process would continue throughout the period of the Nazi regime and would link the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches too with the death counts. The culpability of the Holy See in the attestation bureaucracy was all the more grave, in my view, 
because the outreach and coercion implicit in the centralized modernization of canon law, which Pacelli had spent so many years of his career enhancing and strengthening, was not employed to defy the process. No, through the Concordat itself, canon law was employed to aid the progress, process. And it is for this reason that I claim that Pacelli's story, as a representative of the Holy See of that period, is a por portrait of moral dislocation, a separation of authority from Christian love that aided tyranny and led ultimately to violence. How could Pacelli have accepted educational benefits for Catholics from Hitler while the regime was simultaneously trampling on the rights of the Jews? Was it that he failed to be moved to moral outrage by this circumstance? Was it because they were Jews that he could accept this contradiction? A difficult question to answer, for we cannot peer into the soul, the conscience of this intensely private man who has left no confessional literary remains. But I'm a biographer, and this was an issue I simply could not shirk. Taking all the evidence together from his early 40s, when he revealed signs of fear and contempt of the Jews, through to his behavior in the Rome deportation and its aftermath, I have to say that the best I can say is that this Vicar of Christ failed to see Jews as members of his flock, his Christian agape, that is, the Christian love and respect for all, failed to be inclusive. But, as I've indicated, my overall case neither depends upon making guesses about his conscience, nor on exclusively invoking the Jewish question, nor on a smoking gun document which has yet to come to light. The issue of disjunction between Christian principles and representative of authority most darkly and tragically, I believe, in the Croatian episode <clears throat> in which the so-called Catholic fascist Ustashi carried out a massive program of ethnic cleansing against the Serbs, Jews and Gypsies with the same kind of complicity that we witnessed in relation to the Concordat. There were benefits in the form of mass conversions to Catholicism and the promise of a bridgehead for evangelization into Eastern Orthodoxy, but to the terrible detriment of an entire community. At best, this was an example of fellow traveling, and the damage it caused is represented by the fact that Pacelli showed regular signs of favor to visiting Ustashi delegations, taking these scum of the earth by the hand and granting them his blessing. Hitler's fellow travelers went along with tyranny and even at certain points and in different ways benefited, benefited from it. Hence, they soothed the consciences of the undecided, both at the time and in subsequent generations of demoralized and, um, as happened in Nazi Germany, the courageous. See, for example, Father Rupert Mayer, a Jesuit jailed for six months in 1937 for preaching against Nazi anti-Semitism, but who felt so let down by the Concordat uh, that he ceased any further form of protest. He wrote, since that moment, something struck my heart and prevented me from ever putting in my appearance again. From this point of view, I would argue, such fellow travelers gave greater comfort to Hitler than many of those churchmen who openly supported him. Well, finally, I want to move to the other important parallel with fellow traveling and Nazi scientists, to the false claims of heroism in respect of Holocaust resistance and solidarity with the victims and survivors of the, Holo of the Holocaust by the Catholic Church after the war. The situation has reached a stage with Pius XII where his defenders see him as a victim because Jews refused to acknowledge all that he did to save them during the war. Any suggestion that he might have done more than he did is characterized as calumny and slander. It should not surprise you that my own work in this field has been routinely described as not, not worth the paper it's written on. Father Peter Gumpel, who is the relator or the judge in the cause for the sainthood of Pius XII, 
finds no difficulty in making public statements which are aimed at drawing an equivalence between Pius's sanctity and all his efforts to save Jews during the war. He has written in the tablet, the International Catholic Weekly, of the, quote, unjustifiable attacks against this great and saintly man. In its major statement on the Holocaust, published in 1998, the Pope praised Pius XII for what he did personally to save hundreds of thousands of Jewish lives, and in a footnote, he praises the wisdom of his diplomacy. Commis commiseration with the victims who lost their lives has to pause while the document takes time to defend this poor papal victim. Then there is Paul VI, who talks of Pius XII's heights of heroism, claiming that he used his voice and his activity to proclaim the rights of justice, to defend the weak, to give help to suffering, to the suffering, to prevent greater evils, and to smooth the path of peace. Well, the fact is that Pius XII did indeed do much to help the Jews during the war, and I'm willing to grant that a case can be made for saying that he was paralyzed by the unbearable dilemma into which he had been placed. But it is equally true, as I have claimed here tonight, that in the early stages, he and Pius XI entered into a form of collusion with Hitler that helped Hitler to power at the earlier stage, and hence shared in the moral ambiguities that gave Hitler dignity and acceptability. He was a fellow traveler at this early stage, and that fellow traveling cannot claim a neutral apolitical status. But instead of hearing the Catholic Church admit the damaging consequences of Pacelli's relationship with Hitler in the early stages, we have a situation that is parallel with that of Heisenberg and others in the post-war era, the claim for heroic status. In 1946, on August the 3rd, Pius XII spoke to a group of Arab visitors who had come to the Vatican for an audience. He chose this occasion as an opportunity to boast about all that he had done on behalf of the Jews during the war. And I quote, We condemned on various occasions in the past the persecution that a fanatical anti-Semitism inflicted on the Hebrew people. End quote. Given everything that we know about the carefully nuanced utterances made by Pius during the war, given the single instance in which he spoke against the hundreds of thousands of people not barked down for death, but without mentioning the fact that they were Jews or the fact that their tormentors and killers were Nazis, this claim was a lie. And it was a boastful attempt to plant himself on the moral high ground under false pretenses. There's no time <coughs> to rehearse here the repeated efforts from diplomats through the summer and fall of winter 1942, pleading with Pius to speak out on behalf of the Jews as the details of the final solution became known, including the fact published in the London Daily Telegraph and subsequently the New York Times that more than a million had already died. Writing to a correspondent back in England, the British diplomat in the Vatican expressed this view and I quote, it is very sad. The fact is that the moral authority of the Holy See, which Pius XI and his predecessors had built into a world power, is now sadly reduced. Later he reflected, I am revolted by Hitler's massacre of the Jewish race on the one hand, and on the other, the Vatican's apparently exclusive preoccupation with the possibilities of the bombardment of Rome. When the American representative of the White House, Myron Taylor, came at risk of his life to the Vatican in the fall of 1942, the Pope's Secretary of State of the period, Cardinal Tardini, commented in a note to himself, and I quote, Mr. Taylor talked of the opportunity and the necessity of a word from the Pope against such huge atrocities by the Germans. He said that from all sides, people are calling for such a word. But no such word, as we know, came. And we also know, because it has been repeated ad nauseam by his defenders, that the reason for the silence, or at least the innocuous statements, was that he believed that to speak out would only harm the situation of the Jews all the more. So, how come, immediately after the war, he could claim to have spoken out on various occasions for the Jews and against the Nazis? 
In fact, Pacelli told the French ambassador the day after the broadcast in which he failed to use the word Jew or the word Nazi by saying that if he were going to use such words, he would also have to denounce the communists. His own words show that he had never been specific about Nazi atrocities. He had never been specific about Jewish victims. But we have it on record that he boasted after the war to have been specific about both. I should like to end now by standing back from this focus <coughs> on a set of events and issues some 60 years now in the past and take a broader overview of what we're dealing with. In all the torrent of media coverage on the terrible and tragic events of the 11th of September 2001, which saw an act of savage mass murder inflicted on the people of this country as they went about their everyday lives. One piece stands out for its appalling triteness and stupidity. Writing in the London Guardian on, the sa on Saturday following the attack, an individual who is often described as the cleverest man in Britain, namely Professor Richard Dawkins, the author of The Selfish Gene, and who holds the Chair of Public Understanding of Science in the University of Oxford, claimed that the root cause of the attack was religion. That we would not rid the world of violence until we had rid the world of religion. It was religion, he said, that turned civilian aircraft into guided missiles <coughs> and weapons of mass destruction. As we know, most absurd and twisted statements by very clever men contain a small grain of truth. For who can deny that religion down the centuries has presented a Janus-like face to the world? Yes, there were atrocities committed by the Crusaders, the, 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 the Inquisitions, the witch trials, the wars of religion, and the Christian persecution of Jews down the centuries. To this very day, in my own country, the United Kingdom, Catholics and Protestants have murderously eat each other's throats. On the other hand, we're aware that the people of the book Christians, Jews, Muslims have scriptural and spiritual resources that celebrate a non-judgmental love of all our fellow human beings and a philosophical and theological underpinning to make that precept feasible, namely the belief that we are all without exception children of God and that we are all without exception equal in the eyes of God and destined towards him. Our belief systems, our religions, however, are not immune from the effects of a tragic tension prompted by that profound dilemma. Does human flourishing come from freedom or does it come from control? I believe that Pacelli's story is chiefly of interest in that it shows Christian love in conflict with institutional authority that sought to promote its unity and survival through overweening control. In precise terms, we are talking about the tendency within the Catholic Church during this period to greater centralization, away from subsidiarity, away from pluralism, and away from local discretion. For a very long period in the history of the Catholic Church, the Vatican was dominated by canon lawyers who attempted to use church law as an instrument of control. They developed their trust in that centralized control to a point where it became dislocated from the love that forms the basis of the Christian faith. That separation allowed the church to do deals with the devil, to turn a blind eye to the sufferings of the Jewish minorities in Germany and elsewhere, to become moral fellow travelers with the most evil regime in human history. The result of that accommodation, that failure to rise to the greatest challenge ever posed to Christians was violence. Have we Catholics, and I count myself as one of the faith, learnt these lessons of history? There are indications that those lessons have not been learnt, but I am a great believer in the pluralism of history itself. Many new studies are in hand that are returning again and again and again to the early or origins of the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Hitler regime. Many of these studies make uncomfortable reading, but I am convinced that in time and with freedom and with diversity of approach, the truth of those years and the significance of that truth for all of us today will prevail 
to the great benefit of us all. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and thank you for allowing me the privilege of addressing you here this evening. encouraged to ask questions from um, uh, Professor Conwell. Um, I just want to make one remark because I am afraid that I didn't make it before. This takes you away from Professor Conwell at the same time. It, I couldn't live with myself if I wouldn't tell so. Um, I, want, I think I didn't make uh, previously clear when I spoke that basically our encouragement and the help and the suggestions and the goodness that was involved in tonight's um, lecture and throughout the years come mainly from Hobbes and Wildenthal, the provost of the university, whom we can be unbelievably and deeply and very strongly grateful for everything that happens. I think I didn't take this remark at first. I was concerned with other things. But this is what I should have said to start out with. <laughs> and please go ahead and ask questions. Yes. Yes, you're, you're right on both scores, but I have to say that when one considers bad things that could have happened um, as a result of him speaking out, one was, of course, that the Vatican was situated um, within fascist Italy, and they were dependent for water and light on, um, on the, you know, the fascists of Rome. Um, and um, another consideration is that Although there was a Vatican broadcasting system, it was um, closed down fairly soon in the war. And another consideration is that had he published, you know, the, the Pope speaks to the world through encyclicals. These are letters to the, to, um, the world. And they'd already had an experience that um, the very first encyclical published in 1939 called Darkness Over the Earth had been picked up by the Germans and republished and everything twisted round. But otherwise, I absolutely grant your comment. I think that's absolutely valid. Look, why don't you come down here? Because I can't hear a word you're saying, sir. I'm really sorry, you're too far away. You can't hear me. Okay, all right. I, I, I would like to ask you really yeah. just, just three, three questions and get your answer. How many and questions? Three. One, one. I'll give me two. No, no, brush me. Come on, one. Give me two, give me two, okay? <laughs> the first one. Yeah. Once the church has seen how Hitler keeps his agreements, yeah. and let's recall that 33, England, France, everybody was running. Yeah. trying to sign agreements with, with Hitler. Mm. Because they saw the guy needed to be contained. Mm. It, these agreements didn't never, they never contained him because he never kept it in. Yeah. 
once the church saw what was happening, did they not issue the only encyclical that's ever been written in any language other than Latin, Midrinder Thesaurus, condemning Hitler and what he was doing to the Jewish people um, in 1938? Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, yes, I can un answer that straight away. Midrinder de Sorge um, was written five years too late. But that's when he started. And, uh, yeah, yeah, but what the other thing was, it was about, if I can answer sure. in full, it was not. It had nothing to do with treatment of Jews. It was all, all about the treatment of Catholics. But he condemned yes, because the priest was being dragged from the... Well, look, well, don't let's have a conversation. Let's have your next question. Yeah. Have you read the article by Rabbi David Dowd that appeared? He's a, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. Yeah. Appeared in the Weekly Standard, February 26, 2001. I've read that article, yeah. And he disagrees with you. Oh, yeah. He does a survey of all the literature yeah. that's out. Recalls Pinchus of Edie's book, and several, I have asked him, excuse me, several recent books mm. written by Jewish authors that are diametrically in contradiction to some of the things that you've said in your book. Plus, Ronald Richlake's book. You're aware of Ronald Richlake's recent book? Yes. Okay. The, well, can I, can I answer that? Because I know exactly what you're asking. This gentleman is saying that um, is an article. Yes, yes said that an article appeared in the Standard, which is um, um, a right-wing rag. I'm sure you all know about it. Well, maybe that's an ad hominem, Doctor. Uh, no, it's not ad hominem. It's ad politics, nothing to do with people. But what is ad hominem is Rick Lack's book, which um, spends an inordinate amount of time trying to claim that I'm not a Catholic, that I'm a fraud. That's an ad hominem item because in the hope in the hope that nobody will read me or that I'm trying to gain you know an unwarranted list uh, you know uh, hearing from Catholics that is the main thrust now look we, we, we don't I, can I meet you outside afterwards and we'll carry on our conversation because there are a lot of other questions I'm sure outside sorry Um, yes, there are two points to be made. They were very welcoming um, because um, 12 years ago I published a book called A Thief in the Night which pretty conclusively proved that uh, John Paul I's fellow um, cardinals and bishops had not murdered him. There was a very famous book called In God's Name and I refuted that book very conclusively. And, so, and also I have to say that when I started this book um, I was quite convinced, having read a book by Owen Chadwick, that I was going to exculpate and exonerate this Pope. Um, so the archives were open, but I have to say that unfortunately, you know, what is open is very thin. You know, um, there's a five papacy rule, which means that you cannot read anything after 1922 at the moment, which is the death of Benedict the 15th. Uh, of course, they have released certain documents, um, the wartime documents, and this is the nub of the uh, problem relating to the commission of Jewish and um, Catholic scholars, which has resigned, because there are omissions from the quite notable omissions from um, the collected volumes, and the Vatican is clearly not um, cooperating in clarifying and you know, supplying the missing information at present. Perhaps you can ask um, Professor Conrad after we have closed this uh, meeting. I am very sorry, but I think we have to. 